Hello and welcome to another episode of This Week in Clean Tech. It's a roundup of the week's biggest stories you need to know in climate and clean energy in 15 minutes or less. Today is Friday, August 16th, 2024. I'm Renewable Energy World Editor-in-Chief John Ingle. Catherine Boudreau from Business Insider, a new publication for us, Mike, will be joining us very shortly. But for now, I'm joined once again by clean tech PR veteran and my best friend in the whole world, Mike Casey of TigerCom. Hello, Mike. What's up, John Ingle? I, I, um, I heard your musings about your travel adventure this yeah. week. It sounded like a pretty tough one. It was tough. So we held our um, advisory committee uh, planning meeting for Distributech International, uh, North America's largest utility conference in um, Florida this uh, <laughs> these past few days. And on the way there, I, I live in Asheville, which is a, a two hour drive from Charlotte or a 15 minute hopper plane. I spent uh, 12 hours there. So that was super Oof. fun. Super Oof. fun. So I came back. Here's the quick story. I was going to go Sunday to Tuesday. Wednesday, I was supposed to have jury duty. And then Thursday to Monday, I was going to be traveling again. How do you think that bodes for a, a young father of a toddler leaving his wife for seven of eight days to manage um, all of the household responsibilities herself and then sitting in an airport for 12 hours? I Not think great. that means you're going to get the con- I think that means you're going to get the, you're going to get the consolation couch when you get home. That's what I think. Yeah. Well, I am home, and she was very gracious, so I appreciate that. We are very thankful for all of you sending in your story recommendations and nominations for Clean Tech of the Week. You can do that by sending an email to rew at clarionevents.com, and I've been keeping better track of it now, so I won't miss it for many months and apologize in my reply. Okay, Mike, let's get started. We already lost like five minutes of time. Impressive new resource from CNET, our friends uh, Sarah Drollett and Tyler Graham. How is solar? How solar friendly is your state? We scored them all. Yeah, this one's cool. CNET just released a map that gives a letter grade to each state based on how solar friendly it is for residential projects. The solar friendly measurement is based on policy in the state, considering factors such as tax credits, property and sales tax exemptions, community solar access, and of course, net metering. They also looked at each state's total investment in the solar industry. Included in each state's letter grade is a list of their rooftop solar incentives available, strongest scoring categories, and categories to improve. Mike, this is pretty cool. What do you think? A vast majority of our audiences are listeners uh, because I don't have John Engel's charismatic good looks. So I encourage people to watch the... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to watch this episode on YouTube because you're going to see a map that's mostly red indicating an F or D grade. Only 25% of states, uh, only 25 states passed, meaning the other half tra- failed their solar friendly test. New Jersey is the only A rank state, while California gets a D in part because its utilities got the state to gut net metering. Garden State has one of the largest solar renewable energy credit markets with some of the highest value energy credits, and panels are exempt from property and sales taxes. This gives us a great snapshot of where things stand today, but even in the best graded state, New Jersey, the price per watt at $2.95 is very expensive by international standards, caused partly because of those pesky soft costs. John, story number two. Yes, second story comes from Rebecca Elliott at the New York Times titled, This Texas Energy is So Bountiful, They Pay You to Take It Away. What could she be talking about, Mike? Well, the, the, she would be talking about a reality check for LinkedIn's uh, many fossil fuel bros who whine about the imaginary war on fossil fuels. Companies operating near the country's largest oil field, the Permian Basin in Texas, are drilling for crude oil, but natural gas typically comes out of the ground along with it, and drillers are running out of pipeline capacity or places to store this gas. As a result, the local market is upside down. U.S. energy producers are actually paying buyers and businesses to take away the excess natural gas. That means natural gas prices fell in West Texas below zero on 57 days so far in 2024. Limited pipeline capacity is restricting this excess natural gas from easily uh, being transported to regions with higher demand. John. Yeah, this just shows that, I mean, the volatility of natural gas, I can't imagine being in that business. And if you follow the uh, energy Twitter accounts of prominence in this space, especially the energy traders, they seem exhausted 
um, at constantly riding, riding these waves. So negative prices are also becoming common in electricity markets because for a similar reason, you don't always have demand at the same time and place as generation, and it takes infrastructure to move that energy around. If we want to transition to cleaner energy sources, we not only need to build the power plants necessary to meet demand, but we need to build the infrastructure to handle the transportation of these energy supplies. So this is a little bit different of a story for us, Mike. I think most realistic people in the energy transition acknowledge that natural gas is going to have a role for probably the next few decades. Um, so we need to make sure that it can serve its purpose in this near term. Mike, our third story. It is one we referenced last week by Julie Zosmer Wheel at the Washington Post. Uh, it's called Americans Tapped $8 billion in tax credits on home energy upgrades. That's a lot. Yeah, another really good one, um, just in visualizing the impact of some of these pieces of legislation. So American taxpayers claimed over $8 billion in IRA tax credits on their 2023 returns for making climate-friendly upgrades to their homes. That's two times what the government product predicted. The average household that installed solar claimed just over $5,000 in credits. More households are expected to claim the credits this year as credit awareness grows. What I'd like to know more about is the extent these tax credits are inducing people to make climate friendly upgrades they wouldn't, excuse me, make otherwise. And Mike, I think this gets back to a common theme on this show. Do people know about the IRA and what impact will it have on this election? I think we get get to more of that in this show. But um, your I thoughts think so. Here? I think what we can say for sure is that whether people are aware of the legislation that has enabled it, these numbers show that clean the clean energy transition is becoming part of more and more Americans' lives, and that's a very good thing. There's, there's evidence that earlier tax credits directly caused people to make climate-friendly purchases, but we've recently seen flat spending on heat pumps, solar panels, and batteries. It could be the tax credit or just keeping the spending flat where it otherwise would decline due to supply chain issues and a shortage of qualified installers. The heat pump installations are gaining market share relative to overall HVAC and home renovations that are supported not only by the IRA, but at, also at the climate rebate programs at state and local levels. John, our fourth story. Yeah, this one's got a few from the Financial Times uh, titled, Delays Hit 40% of Biden's Major IRA Manufacturing Projects. Mike. Yeah, this is interesting. $84 billion of manufacturing investment, that's 40% what was announced in the first year of the IRA and the CHIPS Act, has been delayed for months or years or just paused indefinitely. It's due to increasing expenses related to labor and supply chain issues, underpriced solar panels and batteries coming from China, and slowing demand and a lack of policy certainty in an election year. These delays have impacted solar panel and electrolyzer factories, battery storage facilities, lithium refineries, EV lines and other manufacturing plants that would have created jobs and boosted local economies, but they still can if we can get them online. John? Yeah, and just to circle back on the uh, major pieces of legislation, CHIPS, bipartisan infrastructure law, IRA, and do voters recognize their impact and will they vote accordingly? I think this is another example of that. Many of these projects, even with these delays, they take years to, to build. You can announce a giant so solar manufacturing plant, but that's going to take, what, 24, 36 months, maybe more to bring online. Many of these clean energy projects that are cashing in on the credits themselves sit in an interconnection queue for three or four years. So it, it, it really takes time to materialize. And I think that might be contributing to this, this awareness gap that we talk about so frequently. Um, and, and with all the hand-wringing about Trump and what he'll do to the IRA, I, I Project 2025, he's distanced himself from from that to a degree. I don't know that the IRA chips, bipartisan infrastructure law, are at as much risk as maybe, you know, EPA rules and, and other, you know, federal stipulations. So, um, but something obviously to watch as we march toward November. All right, Mike, story number five. Our last story is written by a uh, This Week in Clean Tech newcomer, Catherine Boudreau from Business Insider. It's called How New York City's Data Centers and Rockefeller Center Can Help Power a Climate Solution. Catherine, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. It's great to be in such good company among a bunch of other awesome stories on renewable energy and the energy <laughs> transition. Great. I, Mike, I want a reporter to come on and say first time, last time. You know, like the old, <laughs> the old radio convention, first time, long time caller. Because that's going to happen. Well, if you keep mis if you keep 
cracking us up and taking us over, they will. But if they if we just follow my plan, they'll all want to come back. That's true. Is that okay. All right. Let's get to your your hard hitting question that you hit all of our reporters <laughs> with. Catherine, we want people to read your story. If they have not, what is the big takeaway? Yeah, I think the big takeaway is that um, gas utilities are exploring alternative business models, some because they want to, many because they have to because of state regulators. Um, And in New York City, for example, the uh, utility Con Ed is going to pilot some thermal energy networks. Um, And basically, this is if they get approval. Um, It's in the design phase right now. But um, it would be hooking up like heat pumps in buildings that waste a lot of heat, like with data centers or Rockefeller Center, uh, and piping that excess heat into redeveloped affordable housing complexes and mm. communities. Um, so that way it could be more energy efficient. That's the goal. Um, and hopefully less costly for customers that have to pay expensive heating bills in the winter, for example. Catherine, you mentioned another pretty interesting project uh, being done by Eversource, um, which is a, a little different, but still an example of, you know, using some of that that gas infrastructure and um, figuring out how to a- enable clean energy in different ways, and this time with geothermal. So what, what, what was the comparison that you were making there between Con Ed's attempt to utilize that waste heat and Eversource going in a different direction, which I believe they described as, as first of its kind? Yes, for sure. So Eversource, the utility, it's in Framingham, Massachusetts. Um, they have already uh, launched this uh, multi-year pilot project. And what they did was do, um, like, they basically draw bore, drilled boreholes into like 100 feet below the ground. And then um, they connected these water pipes um, to a bunch of different buildings in a community in Framingham, Mass. Um, and essentially, it's going to like move heat around the neighborhood through these heat pumps. And um, because if you drill a uh, hole into the ground, like the the temperature of the earth is about 55 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can see how like, you know, in the winter, you would want to exchange that and make it um, like bring that constant heat up into the building and then it would go the other direction in the cold, in the cold weather. So um, yeah, not an engineer here, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> and we aren't either, as many have pointed out in the REW at ClarianEvents.com. Um, Mike, your next question. <laughs> Catherine, I know this sounds uh, like, a, like a, a one-on-one question, but I, I assume that there is a limit on the distance between where the source of the heat is, the data center, on, and the place that receives the waste heat, like it can't be that far away. Is that right? Well, I think in, um, I think that's true. I think these thermal energy networks, as they're called, is best used in kind of like a condensed area. Um, like, for example, in New York City, the pilot that they want to do at a, a building with data centers, the affordable housing complex is just like a few blocks around the corner. Um, mm. And then... It, in Framingham, Massachusetts, at the Eversource project, um, it is really concentrated within this one community. Um, so I agree. And also, I mean, it's good to test it out on a small scale for now because these projects are very expensive. Like there are pretty high upfront costs. So uh, they need these utilities need to figure out like the best way to charge customers. You know, how energy efficient is it really um, and whether it's just feasible on a larger scale. Well, John, we're just about out of time. We need to go to our Clean Checker of the Week. Yeah, this week's Clean Checker of the Week is Samuel Truth Seeker. If that's not a journalist name, I don't know what is. That's that's a lost lost opportunity. I'm CEO of uh, Solvari Solar. His system view of rooftop solar enables panels to be installed in two minutes rather than 20 minutes. and is based on over 20 years developing solar products. So congratulations to Samuel, our Clean Checker of the Week. Samuel Truth Seeker. I want to be John Truth Seeker. Well, you kind of are in spirit, John. It's, that maybe you just got to settle for that in this he lifetime. Said, he could adopt me. I'm only 31. I'm still, you know, in the <laughs> earlier stages. All right. Get us out of here, Mike. No, there's not a market for trouble to youth at your age. I'm sorry. All right. We have to thank our wonderful producer, Brian Mendez, and Claire Quirin and Alex Peterson back from vacation helping us gather these stories. And thanks to Catherine Boudreaux from uh, Business Insider for joining us on this episode of This Week in Clean Tech. Please subscribe, give us feedback, and share your story suggestions. And you can read all of those articles, including Catherine's, 
in the episode description by clicking those links. So thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time. Thank you, John Engel. We're sneaking up on 50 episodes. So hopefully because you behaved yourself, Catherine will come back at, at a later uh, at a later date on our next story. That'd be great. All right. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Thank you.